Well, good morning again, everybody. And I do want to uh, say before we get started, I want to say a big thank you to everyone that helped yesterday with our uh, our movie night. So for those, or not movie night, I'm so used to movie night. For our trick or treat on Main Street, if you weren't there, um, we bought 500 boxes for the popcorn, and that was gone in an hour. So um, we handed out probably six or 700 things of popcorn. Who knew people love free popcorn so much? Um, and the people waited a while after a while. Um, my dad popped popcorn yesterday from 9 in the morning until it ended. So he's been popping popcorn for a while. So um, it was a great event. So thank you for everyone that came out to that. And thank you to Lauren, who's back there, who planned all of it um, as well. So um, thank you for being out for that. So we're part, in part four of our series, Upside Down. Um, my kids, they have a, a, a play place outside um, where it has slides, swings, monkey bars, all that kind of stuff. And my kids will go out there. And um, every once in a while, I'll go out and swing them. Thank, thankfully, they can swing, they can do the, do it themselves. It's for those of you who have really young kids, it's a lifesaver when they can do it themselves. You don't have to push them. It's awesome. So they go out there and they can do it themselves. But I'll go out there and play. And then a lot of times they'll use the monkey bars and they'll go upside down on the monkey bars. Be like, Dad, why don't you try? And I'm always like, Guys, there's no chance. If I do this, I'm going to pull something number one, and I can do it for like 10 seconds. If I'm upside down for more than that, it's like I'm going to die. It feels like. And so this week I was looking it up. I was like, Wonder how long you can actually go upside down, or what would happen if you were up, upside down for a long time. Here's what I found. I don't know if you may know this or not, but um, if you are upside down for a long period of time, extended periods of hanging upside down can lead to fatal consequences likely due to as- asphyxiate, uh, asphyxiation. Sorry, When inverted, the lungs can become compressed by heavier organs, making it challenging to absorb sufficient oxygen, especially when the head is positioned directly beneath the feet. And then prolonged inversion can result in blood pooling in the brain, potentially causing ruptured blood vessels and brain hemorrhages and heart failure due to the heart's inability to manage the increased blood flow and maintain blood pressure. And then I found this story. And I, I, it's on, I don't know if it's actually true, but I found it on the internet, so I assume it's true. John Jones, he was, he was hiking at a place called Nutty Putty Cave. Suppose this was news I, I learned about this week. He's hiking. It's a place that he's gone a, a, a lot of times, and he went to this one spot where he was hiking that was a really small area. When he was a kid, he used to get through it very easily, but now he's an adult. He's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'll I'll be able to get through it. And so he put all of the oxygen out of his lungs so that he could squeeze through. Then when he got, when he was trying to get through, he inhaled, which expanded it, and he got stuck. And some, his brother was there and was trying to get him out. They couldn't get him out. He was stuck in between these two rocks. And eventually they go, he hikes back to get service, calls 911. They come out. They try to get him out, and they get a pulley system, and they actually are able to get him out. And then the pulley system breaks. He goes back into it, upside down this time, and he's there for 28 hours until he died 28 hours later. So welcome to church, everybody. I just thought it was like he was stuck. Look it up. John, John Jones, Nutty Putty Cave. Don't be upside down for a long period of time. Anyway, so what I was thinking about this week, and we're doing this whole series called Upside Down, and... That, that what we've been saying this entire time, the kingdom of Jesus is an upside-down kingdom. But here's what really we're learning. When we participate in Jesus' upside-down kingdom, what we start to learn is that this is, his kingdom is not actually the one that's upside-down. It's the kingdom we've been participating in for so long in this world that we start to think that, hey, what sin has to offer us, and we do that, it feels good to us. It feels like it's kind of what we want. It kind of, but then when we start to participate in Jesus' upside-down kingdom, it feels like backwards. But then we learn, this is actually how I was meant to be. This is actually how my soul was meant to be. This is actually who I was designed to be. And if we, as people, stay upside down long enough in the world and in sin, it will eventually kill us. And each week, we look at a diff- we've been looking at a different upside down kingdom ethic. And today, we're looking at one that I find every single person, starting with me, has trouble with. And here's the upside down kingdom ethic we're going to look at today. Forgiven people forgive. Forgiven people forgive. Forgiveness can be very hard, can it? You know why? Somebody has wronged you. Something happened to you and you were wronged. You were hurt. You were betrayed. Something did something to cause you pain. For me, when I've been wrong, you know what I want? Vengeance. That's what I want. I want, if you make me feel pain, I'm going to make sure you feel pain. That's, that's exactly what I want. Forgiveness, I don't want to do that because it feels like when I forgive this person who actually wronged me, it's like, why am I giving them this gift? They're the ones who hurt me. Maybe, maybe if they show that they're sorry enough, then I might forgive them. Maybe if, if they do enough to show that they are remorseful and they turn from their ways, then maybe I can forgive them. But 
forgiving someone that doesn't show, doesn't say they're sorry, or doesn't say sorry enough, or doesn't show that they're sorry, I, I'm not, I don't know if I can do that. Because what I really want to do is make sure that the pain that they cause me, I want them to feel that pain. That's what I want to do. I don't want to forgive. The only way I really want to forgive is if somebody else shows enough that they deserve their, my forgiveness. But if they don't show that they deserve my forgiveness, I don't want to forgive them. Now, this isn't a new problem. In fact, uh, Matthew, and Matthew records a time when Jesus was asked about this exact thing. And he talks about this new kingdom ethic and he tells this great story. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 18. If you have your Bibles or Bible apps, Matthew chapter 18, we're going to start in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus, at this point, had just finished his great sermon about the unity of the church and how the church needs to be unified. And Peter here, after hearing about how the church needs to be unified, says, hey, how often should I forgive my brother or sister? Now, we don't know this, but I imagine Peter has someone in his head. I imagine Peter probably like, how often should I forgive this one person that if I'm, we're called to be unified as a church, but there's this person I think about that wronged me? Because if you read the Gospels, Peter seemed like a kind of angry guy. Like, Peter, uh, when someone tried to arrest Jesus, he's the one who took the sword and tried to kill a soldier. That's Peter. Uh, when Peter started denying Jesus, um, the third time he started just cussing up a storm to prove that he did not know Jesus. Jesus kind of seemed like a guy who would have someone he's having trouble forgiving. He probably had someone in mind. Just like I assume that once I said we're going to talk about forgiveness, someone popped into your mind. It's my guess. Whether it's, it's a loved one or a family member or someone who's not even around anymore, a friend, somebody probably popped into your mind. It's like, oh, that's a person that I am having trouble forgiving. Peter here, he says, well, how many times he forgives? Up to seven times? What he's trying to do here is win some points. See, back then, the Pharisees, they would say that when it came to forgiveness in that culture, you would forgive three times. That's how many times you forgive, and then three strikes are out kind of rule, right? Three times. So Peter here is going, I'm not going to do three times. I'm not going to do six times. I'm going to do seven times. So here he's like, kind of like, no one, no one forgives seven times. Like Mother Teresa wouldn't forgive seven times. So is that how often, Jesus, should I forgive seven times? That's a lot, right? Look how Jesus answers. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. Jesus is very clear here. If you do the math, 70 times seven equals 490. So you count when someone wrongs you, and when they get to 491, you cut them off. That's the end, right? Now, what is Jesus trying to say? He's not giving a literal number. He's just basically saying, Peter says seven. He goes, not seven, but 70 times seven, as in, you just always do it. When it comes to forgiveness, you always forgive. And to further explain his point, he tells this amazing story that also tells us the gospel story. Here's the story he tells in starting in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. The king here, he wants to settle accounts with his servant, expecting that this, this servant's being honorable and not stealing from him. Think of it this way. Imagine you're an assistant for a CEO, and they give you the company credit card, and you need to make sure that you spend it on company things, and eventually you're going to have to turn in all the receipts. By the end, you go, oh, no, I've been spending this on myself instead of the company. Now I owe some money. That's what's happening here. When the king goes to settle accounts, there is, the servant owes 10,000 bags of gold. What commentators say is this is about 10,000 talents. If you translate that into our time period, it would be about $12 million to $1 billion he owes. The point Jesus is trying to make here is it's an amount, amount he can never pay back. If someone says, hey, you now owe someone $12 million, you'll go, well, then take me to jail. I can't pay $12 million back, right? That's the point. It's an unpayable debt. This servant can never pay it back. That's the point. Verse 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. This would be a normal thing in that culture where if, if you are not able to pay back a debt, then you can do, this can happen. You become a slave or you can, they can take you because they need to cover the cost somehow. And just one servant being a slave, that wouldn't have been enough. The top price back then for a slave was about one talent. That was about the top price. So that's not even close to the amount that is owed by the servant. So this servant owes an amount he can never pay. And even if the master took him and his entire family and everything he had as slaves, he still is going to be at a loss at this point. So you see that the master has been wronged. I mean, the servant stole from him. He's been wronged in this situation. He deserves for it to be made right. So this is what would have happened in that culture. Verse 26. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. 
Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay everything back. The servant can't pay it back. He's just saying whatever he can. He's begging to just have some mercy, but he can't pay it back. There's just no, he will never be able to pay that back. But look what the master, the, the master does. Servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Another translation says that the master showed compassion to him. This, this compassion led him to mercy. The servant owed an amount that he could never pay back. The, the master had every right to take the servant as a slave. Every right because he was owed that. But out of his grace and compassion and love, he cancels the debt. A servant owed 10,000 debts to 10,000 talents. Now he owes nothing. Imagine the joy that you would have if you owed someone $12 million. Let's say you owed the government $12 million. And they, out of the kindness of their heart, they would just say, you know what? You don't need to pay that anymore. Imagine the joy you would have from that. That's, that's what's happening here. You don't deserve that debt to be canceled, but yet it is canceled. That's what happens to the servant. But the story's not over. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. I, I like this detail Jesus added on there. Just imagine like, anyways, okay. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. The difference here between 10,000 bags of gold and 10 and, uh, and 100 silver coins, it's night and day. I mean, the amount is just a crazy amount. 100 silver coins would equal 0.000001% of the amount that the servant actually owed. That's, it's a huge difference. At the same time, this is a significant amount. So again, let's use our analogy. The first, first the, the servant was owed his master $12 million. It's a lot. It's canceled. Now this other servant owes him it's about $20,000 to $50,000 in our time period. That's still a significant amount. If someone owed you that much, you would want that money, right? That's a lot of money. It's a, a significant amount. The servant has a reason to be upset because he is owed this. That is a huge amount. He takes his anger out on him, and then it, the story continues, verse 29. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. Just like the first servant did to his master, the this servant is doing it to the same one. Say, please, please, I, I will pay it back. The difference is this servant can actually pay it back. Like eventually, you could have a, if you buy a car, you have a loan for $20,000, but you can eventually pay it back. So this servant actually could. The, the first servant, he could never pay it back. This one actually could. So what does the first servant do? But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Even though the servant received this tremendous grace and this tremendous mercy from the master, he refused to show it to his fellow servant because the debt he felt was just too high. The debt was too much to be paid back immediately. Verse 31, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. If, if the first servant never made, had this tremendous debt that he had to get paid off. If that never happened, if he never had this amount that he could never do, what do you think all the other servants that aren't part of the situation that just see what's happening, what do you think they would think? They would probably be like, yeah, he owes you. Yeah, if he can't pay it, send him to prison. Yeah, you should do that because that's a, I mean, $20,000, that's a whole lot. The problem is all the servant, other servants saw this first servant have that grace. He goes, how, how could you not show grace to this one when you received grace that was way more than that. What do you think happens when people around you see you as someone who you may, if you confess to be a follower of Jesus, that means you confess to receive the grace and forgiveness of God. What do you think the people around you who see you confess to that, but not forgive somebody else? Think? What do you think they think? What do you think happens to those who are seeking to know the forgiveness of God but yet they see you, a person who says you've accepted that forgiveness, refuse to give it to somebody else in need. They would be outraged. Our lack of forgiveness hurts our credibility to evangelism. The story continues, verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. The, the master is understandably angry here. I showed you mercy and, and compassion, and now you demand justice? If you want justice, you will get justice. 
Justice means you're going to prison now. Justice means you're going to have to pay that amount back now. If you want justice, that's what you will get. And, and in case the people that are reading this or the people that are around are, are confused on what Jesus is talking about, he makes his point crystal clear in this last verse. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. If you want justice, you will get justice. But you don't want justice. This is why you need to forgive from your heart, because forgiven people forgive. I mean, the gospel message is that when we were separated from God, a, a separation that's caused by our sin, by the things we've done wrong, when that separation happens and there's nothing we can do to get to God, that God sent his son to pay our penalty, to pay our debt, so that we can now have a relationship with God. That we, when we repent from our sins, we are forgiven in God's sight because of the price that Jesus had to pay. Forgiven people forgive. If you believe in that gospel, that means you're forgiven. And we are called to forgive. But here's something that I know about all of us. You will be hurt by other people. From people who you consider friends, from people who you thought were friends, to spouses or ex-spouses, to, from your kids, from your church. You will be hurt by people. And if you do not forgive the people who have wronged you, what will start to happen is resentment. Resentment will build and build and build. Here, here's what it's like. I've used this analogy before, but I think it's a very easy way to remember this. You take a soda. I'm not going to open it. Relax, everybody, okay? For all of Rob's stuff's here. He's watching me quick. What were to happen if I open this soda right now? It would explode everywhere, right? There, so much soda would get out. Of, I, it would be soda I can't get back into the bottle, right? When we don't forgive people, here's what we are doing. We're slowly building and building and building. And you know what's going to happen eventually? Eventually you're going to snap. Eventually you're going to explode. Eventually you're going to say something you didn't want to say. Eventually something's going to come out of the bottle that you cannot ever get back in. Our relationship will be changed forever because you have not forgiven. That's what happens when we do not forgive. Pressure builds and builds and builds. And we don't always do this selfishly. Sometimes we're like, well, I'm just going to let it slide. I'm just going to not think about it anymore. I'm just going to, you know what, I, it just it doesn't bother me. I'm just letting it go. But if you know deep down whether you've actually forgiven, and if you're not careful, you just continue to build and build and build. You, you know why, for some of us, we can't just move on? You know why, for some of us, we just have so much trouble forgiveness? Here's, here's why. You can write this down. Forgiveness always has a cost associated with it. Forgiveness always has a cost associated with it. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why, why couldn't God just say, you know what, you're forgiven? I mean, technically, God could have done anything, right? But the reason why he did that, because a debt was had to be paid. There was a cost from the sin that we have done. The reason why God didn't do that is the same reason you can't just do that. There's a cost every time. Every time you need to forgive somebody that truly wronged you, there's a cost associated with it. There's a debt that someone now owes you. The servant owed a, a, a debt to the master. The master canceling the debt. The debt doesn't go away. Who has to pay the debt now? The master does. That was an amount he was owed, that he was robbed, that he will never get back because of his grace. It will always be a cost to granting someone else forgiveness. It, it will cost you your pride. It will cost you being right. It will cost you the retaliation and vengeance that you really want deep down. It will feel backwards. It will feel upside down. Forgiveness is saying, I release you from the debt. The, the debt that you owe me, I release you from that. You no longer owe me that debt anymore. There will always be a cost, but there is a much higher cost when you withhold forgiveness. I love how Angela uh, Bottomer is a licensed psychotherapist. She says it this way. I love this quote. She says, when we hold onto grudges and resentment, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. There's two analogies I really like to use when it comes to um, forgiveness. One is uh, of a jail cell. What we tend to think is when someone wrongs us that um, we don't want to forgive them because we're letting them off the hook. We're releasing them from that prison. But what we find out is when you actually forgive, you do release somebody from that prison. You release yourself. That whatever that wrong that they did to you, that has built a prison around you. And if you won't forgive, you're going to be stuck in that prison of that wrong that has been done to you. When you forgive, you release yourself from that prison. Another analogy I've heard 
is bed sores. I don't know if you know bed sores, but if you lay on a bed for too long, you lay in a, in a spot too long, there are certain spots that will get start to get infected and start to hurt, and you have to make sure you move the body around and that kind of stuff, especially if somebody's like in a coma or anything like that. Here's what tends to happen. There's one spot that you don't move it around enough, it will eventually spread. And the healthy tissue that's around it will start to also be affected. And it will happen to you too. If you won't forgive this person, it's not just going to affect that. It's going to affect your marriage. If you don't forgive this person, it's going to affect the way you treat your family. If you don't forgive this person, it's going to affect the way you treat your friends. And if you don't treat this one friend that hurt you, you might let it out on another friend. It will, it will affect everything. Forgiven people forgive. Jesus made it clear. You, if you consider yourself a follower of him, that means you are forgiven. You are demanded to also forgive. Forgiveness is releasing them from the debt that they owe you. And when you do that, you will find that you are the one being free. You will find that you are the one being cured. But the problem with forgiveness is there's some misconceptions when it comes to forgiveness. There's really two big ones. I'll give you both of them. The first one is this. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting. We tend to hear this, hey, forgive and forget, right? That's what we're called to do. That's not in Scripture. That's not biblical. The, the closest we have to that is Isaiah 43, and this is talking about God, not even about us, but it says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. That's the closest we have to forgive and forget, but it's, it's not a biblical principle. So we think, you know what, I just need to forgive and forget. And then we say, all right, I'm going to forgive. But the problem is I keep remembering. It's still there. I, I don't know. So I haven't forgotten. So then we start to think, okay, if I haven't forgotten, then I guess I haven't forgiven because forgive and forget. Do, do you really think that God has amnesia? Do you really think that God, when, when you do something wrong, God asks forgiveness, like, oh, well, I completely forgot it. I forgive and forget. So it's gone forever. No, no, that's not, that's not what happens. God doesn't forget our sins. He chooses to release us from the debt of our sin and doesn't hold us to that debt anymore. He chooses it. God chooses not to hold it over us any longer, even though he could. And if he did, it would be just and right because he is God. But out of his love for us, he does not hold it over us anymore. Instead, he gives us grace and mercy and compassion. You need to forgive and forget is not healthy and it's not possible. It is allowing yourself to be hurt again if you forgive and forget. It is allowing yourself to be taken advantage of again. It, is, it isn't possible to do. Instead, when you forgive, you fully remember the debt. You fully understand the debt that, has been, that, that you are now owed. And you say, even though I fully remember it, I'm choosing to let you off the hook of it. I'm choosing to not make you pay it back. I'm choosing to not demand justice from you. That's what forgiveness is. That's the first misconception. The second one is this. Forgiveness does not mean a lack of boundaries. Uh, I've seen this all the time with meeting with people or counseling with people. Here's, here's some examples that I've seen um, that, feels, that, that really plays into this. A spouse does something wrong, like very wrong. I mean like infidelity or abuse or something like that. Something very wrong that, that is, is causing major damage. They see the error in their ways. They see it and they, and they actually repent and they mean it. They, they apologize. I'm so sorry about this. And the other spouse, in kindness and grace and in mercy, says, you know what? I forgive you of that. I understand. And then this one goes, great. When can I move back? You might not ever be able to move back. This, biblically, infidelity or abuse is cause for divorce. So this person can forgive you, but say, you know what? I don't know if it's going to work. You're forgiven, but I don't know if it's going to work anymore. Uh, I've seen where a friend hurts another friend. And that one friend says, hey, I'm so sorry I did that. And, and they meant it. The other friend said, you know what? You're forgiven of that. I get it. And, the, and then the first friend says, okay, wait, great. Can we go get dinner? He's like, no, I, I need some boundaries now. I, I need to figure things out. Like, because you're forgiven, but like, I can't just go back to how it was. Things came out of the bottle and you said things that, that, that really hurt me. I still got to process. That even though you're forgiven, doesn't mean we necessarily go right back to it. See, you are always called to forgive. But just because you forgive does not mean that it all goes back to the way it was. No, you need healthy boundaries. It isn't wrong to have healthy boundaries. Having healthy boundaries does not mean that you have not forgiven. Here's the difference. There's a big difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. We sometimes confuse these two. We think they're kind of the same. They are not the same. Forgiveness is only up to me. The person who wronged me doesn't have to do anything. They don't have to say they're sorry. They don't have to do anything because it's fully up to me. It's a gift for me to release myself from the wrong they've done. It's fully up to me. Reconciliation is not fully up to me. It takes two people. 
Not only does, do I need to do what I need to do for reconciliation, they need to do. Now, do I believe in reconciliation? For sure. I think as, as whenever we can that we should do reconciliation, our faith is built on reconciliation, right? Like, that's what our faith is built on. In order for us to be back to, to, be, to have a relationship with God, what do we have to do? Turn from our sins and repent. Then we are reconciled back to God. There's something that we have to do. You're always called to forgive. But because reconciliation isn't just up to you, it's also up to that other person, reconciliation might not always be possible. Reconciliation requires repentance. It requires trust, which takes time to rebuild. And it requires grace from God. You will always get hurt whenever you have a relationship with somebody. Always. That's why Jesus made it very clear that you should forgive. Always. So how do you forgive? If, if we're called to forgive, and that's what we're called to do as followers of Christ, Jesus says, you were called and demanded to forgive. How do we do that? Because some of us, the debt that we have to be paid back is a big one. For some of us, it's a parent that was never there. For some of us, it's, it's a spouse that has or continues to hurt you. It, it's a friend who tried to ruin your reputation or harm you in any way that they could. Forgiven people forgive, but how do we actually forgive? Ryan Howes is a licensed uh, therapist, and psycho in Psychology Today in 2009, he wrote this article about the four elements of forgiveness that I think has been really helpful for me when it comes to forgiveness, and I hope it's helpful for you. Here are the four. I'm going to give you all four. It's A, express the emotion, B, understand why, C, rebuild safety, and four, let go. Now, I know some of you are freaking out that it's A, B, C, four. I know. You guys notice that? Okay, so here's why it's A, B, C, four. A, B, and C can be done in any order but all three of those have to be done first before you can go to let go. All three of those, express the emotion, understand why, and rebuild safety. In whatever order you have to do it before you can let go. So here's what they look like. A, express the emotion. You need to express how the injustice made you feel. If it makes you feel angry, those feelings need to be deeply felt and expressed. If it makes you feel sad, those feelings need to be deeply felt and expressed. Doesn't have to be expressed to the person who wronged you, but you have to express it in some way. Don't numb yourself from the emotions. That's what we like to do. That's why we go on our phones. That's why we, we abuse things, because we like to numb ourselves from the emotions. We need to feel those emotions. Those emotions are good. Expressing those emotions helps it get off your chest. If someone's wronged you, you have to find a way to express those emotions in some way, in some capacity. Again, it doesn't have to be directly to the person, but it has to be expressed. B, understand why. Your brain will always search for an explanation until it is satisfied. You may not agree with the rationale your brain comes up with. You have to figure out, your brain needs to figure out some reason. Maybe you start to look, well, their, their childhood was different, so even though it was so wrong, I, I get how they got there. Or, or maybe it's like they, they, they just didn't see it a certain way. Or maybe the explanation is just pure randomness and there's no way you can say it, but it's ran your brain needs a reason. You need to understand why that wrong should happen to you. You don't have to agree with the reason. It needs to have a reason. C, you have to rebuild safety. The forgiver needs to feel a reasonable amount of assurance that that act will not occur again. Whether it comes in the form of, of a very sincere apology from the perpetrator, whether it's a strong defense from future attacks, it could be a removal completely of that person, of that influence in your life. But safety needs to be acquired. Now, this cannot be 100%. You'll never get to a point where you have 100% safety, but your brain needs to feel safe enough from a future attack in the same way from that perpetrator. And then once you've done all three, express the emotion, understand why, rebuild safety, you have to let it go. Some of us don't want to let it go. Some of us like to be the victim. And we want to continue to be the victim. We get attention by being the victim. We are called to let it go. If you actually want to forgive, you have to let it go. Because you're keeping yourself as a prisoner, not them. If you have trouble letting it go, maybe it's because one of the other three things you haven't done yet. Maybe you haven't actually expressed the emotion or, or understood why or, or rebuilt safety. But once all three of these things are done, the next step that you have to take is let it go. We are called to forgive. Matthew 6.14, Jesus says this. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Forgiven people forgive. If you refuse to forgive, are you actually forgiven? If you refuse to forgive, do you actually understand the forgiveness you've been given? 
You need to forgive. Don't become this person who lets it build and build and build before it comes out and hurts people that it was never meant to hurt. That's what's going to happen. It's not going to hurt the people that wronged you. It's going to hurt everyone else and you. We are called to forgive. Forgiven people forgive. So here's how I want to um, close today. Rashim, you can come on up. But on your seats, besides the impact cards, you also have another piece of paper. And that paper says, forgiven people forgive, and it has the three things. Express the emotion, understand why, rebuild safety. So what we're going to do, today we're going to take communion, which we are, we are reflecting and celebrating the, the forgiveness that we have been giving through Jesus' death on the cross. It's literally, we are remembering a cost that, of his life that was paid. So here's how, what we're going to do. Worship's going to play kind of quietly for a while. Whoever that person was that you thought about the whole time I preached, that, that whoever that was, I'm going to give you a moment to do one, if not all three of those things. Express the emotion, understand why, rebuild safety. Whatever way it works for you, if you want to write to, directly to that person, write directly to that person saying you're forgiven. If you want to write to God, say, God, I need help and forgiveness, do it that way. But I want you to take a moment to express the emotion, understand why, and rebuild safety by writing it out. Some of us, we've never actually done that. And then what I want you to do, after you're doing, done that, I want you to walk over and then grab your communion elements. Do not grab them until you've written it. Because who are we to accept that forgiveness without forgiving first? So after you grab your elements, you can come back. Whenever you're done writing, you can come back. The worship's going to play a song. We're going to take communion together afterwards. We'll have a next step for those papers. But I want you to take however much time you need to practice forgiveness right now. Not in theory, practically right now. I'm going to let myself out of this prison of what that person did. And whenever you're done, I want you to get up and grab your elements and come back to your seat. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you are the God who forgives us, that you are the God who loves us. Dear God, I pray that you help each one of us to take that next step of forgiving the people that have wronged us. God, I pray that you just help each one of us whatever that looks like for us, to understand the debt that has been owed to us, but release that person from the debt, just like you did for us. I thank you that we are able to be reconciled to you because of the forgiveness that you have offered us. Help us right now to offer that exact same forgiveness. In your son's name, amen. So take your time as you write. Whenever you're done writing, go grab your communion elements.